the diabetes and uh, kidney. To speak on this topic, I invite Dr. Chand Shekhar. Uh, briefly about Dr. Chand Shekhar. Dr. Chand Shekhar completed his MBBS from Andhra Medical College. He did his uh, MRCP UK, where he stayed for eight years. Then he did his internal medicine at Boston, USA. He pursued nephrology fellowship at the University of uh, Vermont Medical Center. He was uh, a assistant professor and medical director of dialysis at uh, UVMMC. While he also practiced as a consultant uh, nephrologist, he moved back to India. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, one year ago, currently practicing at Sri Sri Holistic Hospitals as consultant nephrologist. Welcome, uh, Dr. Jan Shekhar. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I really like to thank Idea Clinics for their vision and um, the sense of direction they have. I feel like this is what is really needed for our country. And I'm sure it's going to reduce the burden on our nation because of the value creation and the value addition they have. Um, I thank my chair before I get into the presentation, diabetic kidney disease. This is a humongous topic um, and really I was struggling to find, uh, you know, the, just the relevant things for me to present in this 20 minute presentation. There's so much data to present, there's so many slides that I can make, but I really tried to stick to my, um, the, the, just the basics that are needed. Um, and I also should thank my predecessor, my presenter, Dr. Ram Krishna, because a lot of the things I excluded from what I thought I'll do, like the, the studies and the slides, I saw him present them, the Emperor Reg study and all these things. So I really thank him because he set the stage for me to do this presentation. So um, diabetes, um, as we all know, is the leading cause of uh, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease in India and actually all over the world. Um, um, right now, China is leading in the number of diabetics um, because probably because the, their population is the most as of now. But within a year, it, we are expected to beat China in terms of population. And maybe by 2030, the most number of diabetic population will be there in India, not in China anymore. So both diabetes and kidney disease are now in the top 10 leading causes of death um, as per the World Health Organization um, health estimates in 2019. So we expect as the Indian population is growing with the number of diabetics growing, there will be an epidemic of um, kidney disease patients and all the other complications of diabetes in India. So we should be well prepared. And as on 2021, we know that there are about seven crore, 42 lakh diabetics in India. Now, how does diabetes cause um, problem with the kidney. Um, diabetes causes, the diabetic milieu causes so many different problems and one of them is RAS inhibition, RAS activation, um, leading to renal hypertrophy, increased renal plasma flow and the single nephron GFR will be elevated. So initially when the diabetes is causing its problem, the, there will be hyperfiltration there will be hyperfiltration leading to increased GFR paradoxically, and that seems to cause um, reduced longevity of the kidney in the long term. And the same thing happens um, in, like for example, in hyperglycemia, when there's a lot of glucose coming into the proximal tubule, um, the co-transporters, sodium glucose um, co-transporters type one and two, SGLT2 and one, they'll be upregulated up and there'll be a lot of uh, glucose that is being absorbed in the proximal tubule and along with it because it's a co-transporter sodium will also be absorbed when there is a lot of sodium that is getting absorbed absorbed back into the circulation you know the the sodium loading causes hypertension and increased pressure and also when a lot of sodium is being absorbed the amount of sodium that goes to the distal part of the nephron which is where the macula densa is there the sodium will be low so there will be, be a tubular glomerular feedback from the macular densa, which is the distal part of the nephron, telling the glomerulus that something must have happened. There is low perfusion of the kidney. So let's increase the perfusion of the glomerulus. So what it does is it increases the vas it dilates the afferent arteriole, allowing more blood into the glomerulus. So this leads to glomerular, intraglomerular pressure and thereby 
um, hyperfiltration. So that is one of the initial mechanisms in which hyperglycemia causes um, the problems does it does. In addition to that tubular glomerular feedback, there are a lot of vascular factors affecting both the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole and which lead to increased glomerular pressure and thereby that leads to albuminuria. And some of the um, advanced glycation end products that are there in hyperglycemia, the, they cause um, reactive oxygen species and they lead to stimulation of a cascade of systems where there is pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic cascades and that causes sclerosis of the glomerulus. So there were numerous studies that have been found to show that uh, hyperfiltration is associated with increased risk of moderate to severe albuminuria. Previously moderate albuminuria is called uh, microalbuminuria and severe was called macroalbuminuria, but those are the ones. Um, so controlling this glomerular hyperfiltration is the primary mechanism in which we try to control the renal disease um, induced by the hyperglycemia. So both the ACE inhibitor ARB group of drugs as well as the SGLT2 inhibitors help control this glomerular hyperfiltration. And there are some of the studies that I can show where the GFR is initially reduced when we use SGLT2 inhibitors, but it increases the longevity of the kidney function. So there are several mechanisms in which the, the pathogenesis happens, like the glomerular basement membrane thickening. When the pressure inside the glomerulus is high, the basement membrane gets thickened. There is mesangial cell hypertrophy, uh, matrix accumulation within the mesangium, macrophage infiltration. There is increased vascular proliferation through VEGF um, mediation. Um, this is where, this is the same pathophysiology in which the diabetic retinopathy also happens, the VEGF, which is why we give the bevacizumab injections into the eyes to control the vascular endothelial growth factor. There are several non-modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors just as in any other condition. So age is directly related to the prevalence of the diabetic kidney disease and uh, decreased EGFR. So it's about 8% in, in people from um, uh, in the fifth decade and it rises to 19% by sixth decade and to 35% in their seventh decade of life. Um, similarly, in um, females are found to be, found to have more common CKD in general and also diabetic kidney disease, but their progression from uh, uh, an advanced stage to end stage dis kidney disease is seen more in men. Low socioeconomic status is another risk factor uh, because they have low access to healthcare and health education compared to the rest of the strata of population. And also um, the risk of exposure to unhealthy elements um, and unhealthy behavior is probably higher among low socioeconomic status. So the diabetic kidney disease incidence is higher in low socioeconomic status people. Obesity is another thing which causes, um, uh, which increases the risk of diabetic kidney disease because some of the biopsies we've seen um, in obesity-related kidney disease, um, like for example, um, a, a form of a secondary focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, the, the findings that we see in the renal biopsy are very similar to that of diabetes to some extent, even though those patients didn't have diabetes. So what it says is that obesity creates kidney disease in the following sort of the same pathways in which diabetes affects them. So, even before the person develops diabetes, probably from obesity, they already have changes seen within their kidneys by the, through, through the same pathways. And it's a similar thing even in smoking. So there is nodular sclerosis seen in the kidney and a lot of the pathways in which smoking causes kidney damage um, through endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress and inflammation are the same pathways or at least some of the pathways that the diabetes also uses um, to cause kidney damage. So they're all uh, interlinked in a way. Um, and in hyperglycemia by itself is a risk factor um, in creating diabetic kidney disease problems. Um, even though they have diabetes, their glycemic control should be good because there were observational studies that have demonstrated that lower HbA1c levels are associated with reversal of the hyperfiltration we were talking about because the interglomerular pressure will come down and thereby the albuminuria will come down and the rapidity with which the 
GFR decline happens can also be controlled when you control hyperglycemia. Hypertension is another major risk factor, uh, we all know, and there were studies to show that a systolic BP that is more than 140 millimeters of mercury has consistently been found to increase the risk of development of severely increased albuminuria, and also it increases the risk of reduction in EGFR, so stages of the chronic kidney disease keep rising. Acute kidney injury um, is a risk factor for diabetic kidney disease. Um, in other words, it in when people have acute kidney disease in the presence of diabetes, their mechanisms of repair are affected already, and so when their GFR goes down, or they have an AKI, they don't re recover as well as people without diabetes. So um, th that's a risk factor. How do we diagnose? Well, the gold standard of diabetic kidney disease is uh, kidney biopsy, but we can't do kidney biopsy in, in, so many, in so many people with this, and most of them don't get it, um, particularly in countries like India. And these days, diabetic kidney disease diagnosis is mostly clinical. We diagnose it based on the presence of albuminuria or the reduction of EGFR for more than three months in a patient who is at the right setting, like they should have had diabetes for some time. And like, you know, if it is type two diabetes, we usually think that you know, if type two diabetes with the albuminuria, we think they may have had diabetes for long enough time that at the time of presentation itself, they have features of diabetic kidney disease. Probably in type one diabetes, we usually like to see that it's around five years or so before we think that the features that we see, like albuminuria, reduced GFR, is probably because of diabetic kidney disease as opposed to some other kidney disease. And higher levels of albuminuria as well as lower levels of GFR are independently and additively increase the risk of cardiovascular events and death. So how do we identify people with diabetic kidney disease, particularly when the albuminuria by itself is asymptomatic, unless it's in the nephrotic range, and also the reduction in EGFR is also asymptomatic for the most part. People don't know that they have kidney disease. A lot of them present in the very late stages when their GFRs are less than 20. Nobody will have any symptoms related to kidney failure unless their GFRs are well into the late stage four kidney disease, below 20 uh, ml per minute per 1.73 meter square kind of range. Um, or lower, like, you know, unless they reach that stage, they don't have any particular symptoms from the reduced GFR. Um, most of the time, even when they have symptoms, they don't know that they have to attribute it to the kidney because a lot of them have non-specific symptoms like I feel generally weak, I'm fatigued, I have uh, no appetite kind of symptoms that they don't know that they have to attribute it to the kidney and come to a nephrologist. So, so in such people where we don't have a, a mechanism, a symptom that drives the patient to, towards the doctor, soon enough, how do we detect them? How, how can we identify them soon enough so that we can do something to prevent this progression of the kidney disease? So what we do is we have to do this annual testing of diabetics where we think they may be having kidney disease. So we check albuminuria, we check GFR measurements through uh, indirect ways, like this is estimated, estimated GFR through measurement of creatinine. So usually we check them uh, once every three to six months, and depending on how well they are controlled, we can change the frequency of how often we can check. Um, um, for people, like I said earlier, for people with type two diabetes, we presume that they may have had the diabetes for some time before they presented, and so if they have features of diabetic kidney disease, um, it is very likely to be diabetic kidney disease indeed. Whereas for type one, we usually wait for five years. So how do we treat it? Um, as I said before, there are many risk factors that we need to modify. The non-modifiable ones, we leave them, but the modifiable ones, of all of them, albuminuria has the strongest Pro strongest connection with the progression of chronic kidney disease, that reduction in GFR. So we try to focus our attention towards controlling the albuminuria. And like I was saying earlier, the rise in interglomerular pressure is the first thing that happens, which then leads to several um, cascade of changes that will lead to sclerosis of the glomerulus. So we should f keep our attention in controlling this part of the cascade early in the course of the disease 
um, and thereby we can control the albuminuria and the risk factor. The other things we already talked about earlier were like uh, hypertension control. The goal should be less than 130 to 80 for the most part. But sometimes, depending on the patient, we may have an individualized target depending on like somebody has having um, is old enough, they have Parkinson's disease or some other autonomic neuropathic condition. We want to be a little bit careful about trying to control the top uh, number. Uh, the upper limit of the um, blood pressure that we want to control. Same is the case with glycemic control. Usually we'd like to see that um, their uh, HbA1c's are less than 7%, but that should also be, again, an individualized target for patients. Somebody who's really old, maybe they can have an A1c of somewhere around 8 or something, but the idea is to see that the, we achieve a balance where the microvascular compl complications and um, the risk of hypoglycemia are balanced in such a way that's beneficial to the patient. That is the whole idea. Um, statin use um, is, is also um, um, uh, an important risk modifier that we do um, because people with um, diabetic kidney disease as it is have increased risk of cardiovascular um, mortality and morbidity. So if they also have dyslipidemia, it, it'll, it'll increase the uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, lifestyle changes, of course, smoking cessation, weight loss, exercise, and so on and so forth. KDGO, uh, which is uh, um, um, kidney disease uh, improving global outcome, in 2022, early 2022, I think in January, released some clinical practice guidelines for diabetes management in chronic kidney disease patients. And um, that is on the same lines as we discussed. So initially, we should focus on the life li lifestyle changes, like you know having a healthy diet, diet um, exercise, smoking cessation, weight control, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, there will be first-line um, drug therapies, like you know metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, RAS block it. So the reason why SGLT2 inhibitors and RAS blockade are there in the, in the very first line therapy is for the same reason I mentioned, we need to control the intraglomerular rise in pressure and the albuminuria statins. And then we come to the goal-directed therapy, trying to look at each of those individual things, like whether the cholesterol is under control or not, is the LDL under control, and so on and so forth. BP, blood pressure control, are we achieving it? If not, we make subtle adjustments and specific drugs to get what we want. And it's the same thing with lipid control and uh, glycemic control. So a little bit more in detail about what I just skimmed through quickly. So after the lifestyle changes, in the first line drug therapy, we use SGLT2 inhibitors in type 2 diabetics if their GFR is not less than 20, uh, 20 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. Um, and we continue it until they end up with end stage kidney disease. And we also use metformin as long as their eGFR is not less than 30. Um, or unless they're having severe GI side effects, like we were talking about it yesterday. And um, um, the reason why we don't use metformin in people with less than 30 GFR is because of the risk of MALA, which is the metformin-associated lactic acidosis. It might cause more problems than it solves. And in these, these, are, these are the two things that we use for type 2 diabetes, but for the rest of the ones, we use, um, um, in addition to insulin for the type 1 diabetics, we use RAS inhibitors, that's for the blood pressure control, as a first-line drug therapy because it has dual role. It is also an antiproteinuric drug and also uh, an antihypertensive. So we can control two different things with just one um, medicine and a moderate to high-intensity statin therapy um, to control the dyslipidemia that is usually accompanied in diabetics. So that is the first-line therapy we use and we follow them up with the parameters that we talked about once every three to six months to see whether we've achieved the targets with these therapies. And if we don't, then we, we go to the second line of therapy for controlling each of these different risk factors. So in, in diabetics, if the metformin and SGLT two inhibitors didn't do the job enough, then we go for usually GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists um, because of the evidence that we've seen. These are the ones that I was saying, like some of the evidence that we have um, is, is pretty good for GLP-1 receptor agonists in um, controlling the cardiovascular mortality. Uh, so we usually go for that as the first line within the second line therapy of uh, diabetes. Um, and then even that, if that is not sufficient, we can go for other ones like DPP-4 and so on and so forth. Um, and in terms of albuminuria, 
If the RAS inhibitors, like you know, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs do not do, um, do, do not achieve sufficient um, level of control of albuminuria, or if we have side effects like hypokalemia or hypertension or something that is preventing us from being able to maximally utilize um, these medications, then we can go for the non-steroidal um, selective mineralocorticoid receptor uh, antagonist. And the example is finerenone. I think FDA recently approved that for its use. Um, and we use that in, uh, as a second line um, therapy after the ACE inhibitors to be able to control, um, control the proteinuria, the albuminuria more so. And, um, and in terms of blood pressure, for the blood pressure control, after using the RASI therapy, the renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitor therapy through ACE inhibitors or ARBs, then we usually go for dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like um, amlodipine or something like that. And again, this over here, we use either that or a diuretic depending on their volume status. If I see somebody who's already on an ACE inhibitor and if their potassium is slightly high, if their volume status is slightly high, I might choose a diuretic as opposed to a calcium channel blocker because as it is, they already have, um, maybe they have a, a pedal edema or something, their blood pressures are high. I want to achieve volume reduction more more so than um, trying to go for a calcium channel blocker, which uh, again might give, uh, like a drug like uh, amlodipine might give pedal edema in somebody who's already hypervolemic. So that choice between a calcium channel blocker and a diuretic as a second line therapy for hypertension control is individualized. And I choose one or the other depending on the potassium levels as well. So, and then in terms of once we control the uh, steroid, uh, the statin, well, lipids to some extent with statins, we then um, look at this ASCVD scoring. Uh, we were talking about that as well, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease scoring system. And based on the scoring system, we may choose to use uh, um, an antiplatelet agent as well to reduce the risk um, uh, of cardiovascular events. Um, so that is the targeted therapy that we use um, in patients who have um, risk factors that are modifiable. Um, and in terms of blood pressure control, once we have done with the one with the ACE inhibitors or ARBs, but not both, either one of them, because if we use both ACE inhibitor and ARB, there is a study which shows that there is no extra benefit, but the risk, but the side effects might be higher. So we use either an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. And after that, we go for uh, either a calcium channel blocker, which is a dihydropyridine one, or a diuretic, depending on the need. And if one of them is consumed, we go, go for the other one. So once all three are done, we usually, if we still need uh, additional medications, that's when we go for uh, a steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, which is like the spironolactone or eplernone or something like that. Um, and in terms of the um, antiplay after the control of the cholesterol, once we are done with the antiplatelet agent, we can use um, drugs like ezetimib or PCSK9 inhibitor. We were just talking about that. The the alirosumab or avalosumab injections. Um, I think they're pretty expensive. I haven't seen any in India as yet. Um, or there is another drug, the icosapentathyl. Pentathyl. Um, there is a brand called Cosetil. Um, we're starting to use that. Two grams twice daily is what we use and that reduces the triglycerides triglyceride levels in people who are already on statins and still we, if we couldn't control their triglycerides. And mind you, the triglyceride levels are usually high on the higher side for patients who have had diabetes and we were talking about that as well earlier. So in those patients, if you want to control the hypertriglyceridemia after they have been already on, on statins, that's when we tend to go for this additional drug, icosapentethyl. So... Uh, these are the various treatment um, treatments that we use in an order to achieve lowest risk for patients with diabetic kidney disease. So this is a little schematic that shows um, the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, which um, work in different mechanisms. We already discussed a couple of them. And I also want to bring your attention to some of these things like um, ketogenesis. Um, people who... Um, uh, have a lot of glucose getting excreted, they'll be in a relatively um, starved situation and so that promotes lipolysis and fatty acid oxidation, thereby the, there'll be a lot of uh, ketone genesis, uh, ketogenesis, ketones will be produced and that's why 
in people with type 1 diabetic uh, diabetes, um, SGL2 inhibitors are probably not used because they end up with uh, more often DKA. Some of the other uh, problems with SGL2 inhibitors are like, because there's a lot of glucose coming into the kidneys, the chances of a urinary tract infection is higher. And some of the studies have shown that um, the incidence of uh, toe amputations is also a little higher um, among uh, people who have used SGL2 inhibitors. Um, we already talked about the interglomerular pressure reduction that is the mainstay in which they provide benefit to us. So this is a study, um, it's called DAPA CKD study that got published in the New England Journal um, somewhere around uh, late 2020. Um, basically, the, in this study, about 4,000 participants uh, with EGFR anywhere between 25 and 75, um, and with a proteinuria, urine album creatinine ratio between 200 and 5,000, they were randomized to receive either 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin or a placebo. And the primary outcome of this study was a composite of uh, either a sustained decline in GFR by more than, by at least 50%, or development of end-stage kidney disease, or death from either renal or cardiac causes. And in this, um, you can see that the, the hazard ratio is 0.6 with a pretty good 95% confidence interval, and that interval is far away from one mark, and so it gives the statistically significant P of um, less than 0 0.001. So the probability of this analysis being statistically wrong is less than one in 1,000, so it's a pretty good study. And um, uh, the same thing in, uh, you can see the same evidence across different participants and different risk groups. You can see that the diapagliflozin did much better compared to placebo. And the hazard research for all of them are really good. Uh, the same study, the same thing, but this time it's a renal specific outcome. So uh, compared to the primary outcome in this, death from renal causes alone were included in this composite. And you can see here also, dapagliflozin did much better in the incidence of the uh, uh, composite outcome. The inset you see is just a magnification of the y-axis. And in the same study, death from any cause um, is also better among the dapagliflozin group, as you can see here. So this is a, an interesting slide um, that is from the Ampereg study that we talked earlier about, or uh, Dr. Um, Ramakrishna talked about. So as you, if you observe, there are um, three lines in this graph. Uh, the red and blue uh, indicate the groups that were randomize it to receive either a 10 milligram ampagliflozin or 25 milligram ampagliflozin as opposed to the black line is the placebo. So initially within the first um, four weeks to 12 weeks sort of time, you can see that the GFR has uh, like precipitously dropped in both the groups of the ampagliflozin as opposed to the placebo one, but over a period of um, about 192 weeks, I think it's just shortly, just short of two years, sort of time, you can see that the, the GFR, um, the, the mean adjusted GFR of the placebo group has slowly come down, whereas the GFR in the SGLT2 inhibitor use group has remained more or less stable. So what this says is that when we use these drugs, initially there will be a decline in, in the GFR, which is the same thing that you see in, in ACE inhibitors and ARDS as well. They, there is an initial reduction in the GFR, but that is only there to protect the glomerular apparatus to function for a long time. The longevity will be higher. The end result will be good. Um, this is a study called Figaro DKD study. So this is a study that shows the advantages of finerenone, that is the um, non-steroidal selective mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist finerenone. And um, the, the primary outcome of this study is also a composite of um, death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And as you can clearly see, with time, uh, finerenone fared better. This is a little um, algorithm to help us manage people on ACE inhibitors in people with diabetic kidney disease. Um, usually when we 
start people um, on uh, low dose of um, ACE inhibitor, the problems we might encounter are reduction in GFR, which is kind of an expected thing, and increase in potassium levels. But if, they are, if the reduction in GFR is more than 30% uh, from the baseline, or if the potassium level is high enough to worry us, then we cannot increase when I cannot maximize the dose of the ACE or ARB. And so that is when we tend to go for these these things like sometimes when the potassium is high and I know that there is no other problem, I choose a diuretic or something to try and bring it down um, and still be able to push up on the dose of the ACE inhibitor or ARB. Um, similarly, if, if we notice more than 30% reduction in GFR, then we usually look for other probable causes like, I don't know, there is a renal artery stenosis or some other um, reason for acute kidney injury. So we look for all those reasons and if we are able to uh, and, uh, mitigate those reasons, we will be able to push up on the dose of these benefit uh, giving medicines. If not, we may have to cut the dose back down or completely stop those and choose some other drugs. Anything else? Questions? More than welcome. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chanshekar. That was a very lucid talk covering almost all the aspects. Uh, I have a question I'll start with. So uh, when do you suspect a non-diabetic kidney disease in a diabetic? When do you say we have to biopsy this patient? So a non-diabetic kidney disease is basically um, reduction in GFR among diabetics without proteinuria, without much proteinuria. So often I try to look at um, the urine um, microscopy or complete urine examination to see if there are reasons to suspect the, the, another kind of pathology, like for example, glomerulonephritis, there is, is there hematuria. By the way, hematuria can also be there in diabetic kidney disease, but usually it presents when the albuminuria is pretty high. So in people who do not have albuminuria, but they have had diabetes for long enough time that you suspect that this could be diabetic, this could be non-albuminuric, uh, uh, non-diabetic kidney disease or something like that. I usually look at the urine sediment to see if there is um, uh, you know, features of glomerulonephritis, red cell cast, white cell cast, um, some clue to say that, you know, there might be something else going on or something like uh, euglycemic uh, glycosuria, um, some pH disturbance in the urine, some other clue for me to think that there is um, some other condition and in which case, then I usually discuss the risks and benefits of uh, getting a biopsy and, and I usually have a low threshold for doing biopsy uh, for the most part, like uh, since I've come to India, I've observed um, maybe it's the financial reasons for the patients or whatever, but I have a low threshold to do biopsy. Um, and like I said, usually when I go, go through the urine, if I find um, some clue that makes me think that this is not a simple diabetic case, then I usually prefer bi uh, biopsy. No, I mean, uh, the non proteinuric uh, diabetic kidney disease. Uh, the problem mainly in the tubulovascular rather than the glomerular. And uh, why it's uh, not uh, uh, mean related to the retinopathy as uh, proteinuric uh, DKD? Uh, could you repeat the last part? I mean, uh, the proteinuric, uh, the uh, conventional uh, in, uh, mean, uh, DKD with proteinuria, and if you compare with it uh, with the non proteinuric uh, DKD, the retinopathy is not. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in all cases, subproteinuric DKD, you will see retinopathy. Right. Whereas in um, non-proteinuric uh, uh, DKDs, the retinopathy incidence is comparatively less. Is it because of uh, the involvement of tubule and the vascularity rather than the glomeruli? No, I think in a way, um, say, say for example, in, in, in the retinopathy, to my understanding, like I was saying earlier, the vascular endothelial growth factor plays a, a role in, 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 cause, in, in causing the diabetic retinopathy. And some of the pathways um, cause problems in, in the retinopathy are common in, in kidney as well, but they're not the same. They're not all the same. Some are slightly different in the way the kidney works and in the way the eye works. So there are some differences in the pathology. Some are more associated with the, the proteinuric kidney disease and, and the diabetes, not, not so. And what I 
um, can see some association is like in people who receive bevacizumab injections and it tends to cause um, um, proteinuria among people with uh, non-proteinuric kidney disease till then they have and suddenly their proteinuria increases. So there is an association with the vascular endothelial growth factor and its inhibition that has an effect and that creates the proteinuria part. So I think that's what I can say. So the pathways are not all the same. Some of them are common, some are not, some are not. Well, it's more common in the type two rather than type one. Right. That uh, non-proteinuric variety is more common in type one. Correct. And uh, what is the role of podocyte? And uh, where, where do we see the drugs affecting the podocyte? Um, so, um, drugs affecting the podocyte? Podocyte mean because, uh, as you said, that one of the pathogens is in also in, uh, in the... Right, uh, right. So, um, the podocyte effacement happens, and there is a slit diaphragm in the, in, the, in the glomerular basement membrane sort of area, and some of the medicines that we use, I think, affect that area and cause leakage of the protein. And so, acting on nephrine. Right. Yeah. Acting on nephrine, podocyte effacement and nephrine. Right. Thank you. Uh, so is there any role for routine screening of kidney size in diabetic patients? Uh, role for uh, kidney size? Yeah. Um, for detection of uh, kidney disease in diabetics. So it's partly with, with the question he asked earlier. So usually diabetic kidney disease doesn't cause a constriction or a stricture like a smaller kidneys. It's one of the reasons why the, where the kidney size remains the same. So if I'm suspecting some, some other cause for uh, rise in creatinine or kidney disease, I usually scan them as well. And if I see a shrunken kidney, I would be more in favor of some other uh, etiology for the kidney disease as opposed to only diabetic related kidney disease. So probably that's the only role I have. And people with diabetes, they have vascular disease very commonly like we have seen in heart and lung, wherever. So uh, renal arterial disease can cause um, a shrunken kidney. So th that sort of uh, distinction I make with the size of the kidneys. Um. What is the role of uh, acetylcysteine and uh, taurine in uh, proteinuria? I, mean, um, I haven't been using them um, very much. Um, I'm not terribly convinced of the grade of evidence that I've seen before. Um, and in US, which is where I used to practice, we weren't using them as much. And here in India, we use them quite a lot. Um, I'm a little still ambivalent um, in their use as of now. Uh, I have a question. Not everyone with microalbuminuria uh, progress into end-stage renal disease. Apart from looking at the uh, quantity of microalbuminuria, are there any predictors to look at end-stage renal failure and dialysis in patients with microalbuminuria? So microalbuminuria is one of the uh, strongest risk factors that is the, the association is there, but that's not the only thing. So maybe it's the, some of the other ones that play a role. And also in people, in, in most of the diabetics, when they have albuminuria or not, before they reach end stage kidney disease, if you see the number of diabetics and the number of them reaching to end stage, that's not a lot because a lot of them die before they end up with the end stage kidney disease because of cardiovascular disease most of the times. So um, it's not just the albuminuria, but some of the other factors, I believe, like the hypertension control, lipid control, smoking cessation, so on and so forth. Maybe they have a role in what you're asking. You mentioned quite a lot of um, in, uh, uh, estimated GFR. Which uh, scale, I mean, which tool do you suggest for uh, calculating? Uh, uh, I couldn't quite hear what would No, no, with, reg uh, with regards to calculating, uh, estimating a glomerular filtration rate, which uh, tool do you suggest and uh, why? So there are um, studies to measure the G GFR 
and there are formula to estimate the GFR. So most of the times we do an estimation because for the most part, um, the estimation is very similar to what the measured one will be. And we, I mean, to some, to some, some degree they are very reliable. And so the ad, there is no added advantage for the most part in trying to measure a GFR. And so we, unless there is like, you know, the chemotherapy drugs we are giving or something, then we are, we go for like um, CR51 EDTA measurements and other things for GFR. So in estimation, we have like, you know, CKDAB and MDRD and some of these equations that we use. Um, there are online tools that we use to come up with the estimated GFR. And that for the most part for our management is good enough for our purposes. Which uh, uh, um, Goldcroft, which uh, tool do you suggest? Yeah. Carcroft and Galt, and um, um, it's, it's a formula. We just plug in things and we come up with a number. That's an estimation. Um, are you asking which one do I use? Yeah, yeah, which one? Okay. Um, it's interesting you ask me. So for my daily management, um, I think the labs, most of them give me an MDRD-based e e e equation. And I have this online tool that gives me values for both um, uh, CKDAP and MDRD-based uh, number numbers. And when I've, when I've seen a lot, lot of patients and estimated them, the numbers are not that different for me to make a clinically significant decision difference. So um, I use MDRD one for the most part. Cockroft and Galt, we used to use them um, back um, when we were in the, in the oncology segment, we were trying to make chemotherapy drugs and we needed, so it's just a different estimation. I use MDRD. Good morning, sir. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, so uh, you've been emphasizing on dyslipidemia, right? So I just have a small doubt whether uh, dyslipidemia as such is causing any direct uh, problems, uh, direct effect on the nephrons or is it because of the vasculature or uh, complications that it has a role here? I don't think it has a direct effect on the nephron as such, or not that I'm aware anyway. But because a lot of uh, vascular damage is is what the dyslipidemia causes for, for its pathogenesis, whether it's in the heart or the brain or wherever. And kidney is, a, is very much dependent on the blood vessels. If you see about 300 grams of kidneys receive a quarter of blood supply, there's, there's a highly vascular organ and all, most of the kidney glomerulus you take it or whatever, it's mostly made of um, blood vessels. So if there is a problem with the blood vessels, you're bound to have problem with the organ that's mostly made of blood vessels, I believe. And also, like I said earlier, um, the main reason why we use uh, statins in kidney disease people is to save the patient from cardiovascular mortality uh, because that is the number one killer of um, kidney disease patients. Even before they reach end stage kidney disease, some of them die because of heart attack or whatever. So what good is our treatment trying to save the nephron if the patient dies? Sir, is there any difference with atorvastatin or rosvastatin uh, in patients with diabetes for kidney disease progression? Like uh, so, some of the studies... Yeah, so for kidney disease as such, um, there is probably not much difference between these compared to the cardiovascular ones. So the high intensity therapies versus low intensity therapy kind of thing. But once they come to end stage kidney disease, there, is, there are actually studies which show that the, the benefit that you reap out of statins in CKD or cardiovascular cases is non-existent among dialysis patients. So there is a 4D study, a Dutch uh, study and all. They show that the benefit that you reap out of statin use among other patients is not seen in patients who are, who are on dialysis. So those who are already established on dialysis, if they're on statins, back in my mind, I'm not very sure whether they're doing anything. So if they're already on polyforms, there are a lot of medicines and they're keen to get rid of some of the ones. I sometimes reluctantly or with, with some, um, I remove the statins because that, that they're, they're not helpful. There is no much difference with the um, 
not that I'm aware of within with as as per in terms of the kidney outcomes. If there are no further questions, we'll close this session of complication of diabetes with respect to heart and kidney. Okay, they have a question, I think. Yeah. One yeah, last please. question. So, is there any specific way to know that the diabetic patient may be more prone for stroke? Is there anything that we could do for diabetic patients who are prone for stroke? Or do, how do we know that he is prone for stroke, which is causing mortality in some patients? Um, how do any, we know that a diabetic any is... Any markers or anything? Uh, diabetic kidney disease patient is more prone for stroke. Is there any specific markers which we could? Any marker? Uh, predictive factors. Predictive. For stroke and all, I am not aware of any predictive markers. But the risk factors that we see, we try to uh, mitigate them. Um, particularly for stroke, I am not aware of anything that um, in the diabetic kidney disease and stroke particularly. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if there is Now, mostly I think albuminuria is the thing which is, I think, the risk factor for all cardiac issues, neurovascular probably. So, I don't think there is any other specific uh, marker for stroke prediction. One might be you tempted to use the ASCVD score, which is basically the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease scoring. That might help in putting people at a different risk group and then you may want to address you know, but not specifically stroke and I'm not aware of any such thing.